everyone. Welcome to Palm City. Well, here we are, three quarters of the way through. Are you counting? <laughs> <laughs> Enjoying. <laughs> Ten years. This is the tenth anniversary of Palm City. We owe it to Rachel Seneschal, who works for Calig Hubbard <laughs> Library. I work with Rachel. My name is Michelle Singer, and I'm her program assistant for Palm City. And every year, it's our pleasure to put this festival together and get the artwork um, organized from the elementary school kids and uh, pick the placement of the poems and otherwise just enjoy poetry to the maximum. We are so happy to be here today for Welcome um, for Integrating Personal and Political, a reading with Sue Burton and Carol Potter. I would like to thank our Poem City sponsors, uh, National Life Group Foundation, Vermont Humanities Council, the Hunger Mountain Co-op, Vermont College of Fine Arts, and the Poetry Society of Vermont. They give us really important financial backing to make all of this happen. We are so happy to have Carol and Sue with us today. Carol Potter's most recent collection, Some Slow Bees, was awarded the Field Poetry Prize from Oberlin College Press. She teaches for the Antioch University Low Residency MFA program and lives in Tunbridge. Sue Burton's collection, Box, is a 2018 Indies finalist in poetry and was selected by, the, by Diane Seuss for the Two Sylvia's Press Poetry Prize. Also released in 2018 is her book-length poem, Little Steel, from Fomite Press. She has an MFA in writing from Vermont College and lives in Burlington. They will have a Q&A session after and have books for sale for cash or check. Welcome to Sue and Carol. <coughs> my props already. Well, welcome everyone on this terrible day of the usual rain. Um, I want to thank the Kellogg Hubbard Library for, well, for, for hosting us and also just for Palm City, which is fantastic. So relay our thank yous to Rachel. And thank you to Michelle Singer, who has been a sort of our to-go person, and she's been wonderful. So it's really great. It's such a delight to be reading today with Carol Potter. Um, I first heard her read several years ago at the Norwich Bookstore, and I was taken with her work, especially her heroic crown of sonnets called The Miss Nancy Papers, which is based on the 1960s TV series Romper Room. <laughs> it's a wild poem. Um, <laughs> it's in the book back there. <laughs> it, uh, so a heroic crown is 14 <coughs> sonnets, and the last line of one sonnet becomes the first line of the next. And then you, and then there's a 15th sonnet where you take either the first lines or the last lines of each of the first 14 poems, and that becomes the 15th sonnet. Got that? OK. <laughs> um, anyway, I heard Carol read, and I said, oh, I could do a crown sonnet for Nettie. Nettie was my great aunt who died of an illegal abortion in 1902. I'd been working on a poem, or maybe an essay, or who knows what, for several years and was just stymied by my reams of information. <clears throat> Family history, the legal, legal status of abortion in Ohio in the early 1900s, a year's worth of 1902 Columbus, Ohio newspaper clippings, and my own history, because I worked as, as a physician assistant in women's health centers. My friends were saying, Sue, you should write a novel. So it was a little crazy to think about Nettie as a sonnet sequence. But there's something to be said for structure and these little 14-line boxes for controlling material. So later I'll read some of the Nettie sonnets. Carol and I are billed as reading poems incorporating personal and political details. At first, we thought we were billed as political poets, which seemed either a minefield or a big role to fill. You know, political poetry has had sort of a tenuous reputation in this country. The U.S., the, the present U.S. Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith describes her experience as an MFA student in the late 90s, which is when I went back to Vermont College and got an MFA. The attitude in the 90s, or the attack <coughs> on political poetry, was couched in terms like didacticism and slackened craft and artistically questionable. Good poetry was personal, lyric, and still based on the old Iowa Writers' Workshop mantra of show, don't tell. Of course, there are always undercurrents, just as there have been trends in the other arts of the media or culture as a whole. But in the last maybe 10 years, there's been a shift. 
We have political movements now like Black Lives Matter and Me Too and Pride Fund to end gun violence. And at the same time, our country's politicians are heading us towards fascism. Right now, there's a need for poets, for everyone to speak out. So political poetry has reemerged, although the old term is still maybe suspect. Political poetry is now often referred to as poetry of engagement. If you're interested, we can talk about this in the Q&A. OK, after all that, I'm going to start off by reading a poem decidedly not political. Um, as part of the Palm City celebration, it's posted in the window at the Three Penny Tap Room. I decide to come back next life as a cocktail, a Marilyn Monroe of a drink, plum lipstick, see-through skirt. Yes, I love being irresistible. Drink me, drink me. But what's to become? A martini with curacao and lemon twisties or champagne with creme vette? Aromatic seeds, wild, wild violets, brandy, dashed with cloves. Oh, life is such an adventure. Today's installment, a librarian with the transplanted heart of a biker starts to crave beef, and true story, goes out and buys a Harley. My drink is the color of a heart, has cravings. Serialized romances, card tricks, anchovies. Would you drink me, drink me, if I'm infused with violets, petals tickling your throat, Oh, oh, it's metaphysical, the night sky fizzing, stars like gold canaries, cognac, chartreuse, the cadence of the moon, all that, frog song. I'm the story you'll pick up and never put down. You will become thirsty. <laughs> um, the title of my book, Box, refers to the magician's box in which the woman who is sawn in half is sawn in half. Get that? <laughs> so the magician's box is sometimes referred to as the celibate box after its inventor. So here's a description for your edification about the celibate box. The celibate box. The bloodthirsty, hair-raising celibate box in which a woman is sawn in half was introduced in 1921 by the magician P.T. Selbit, with the prototypical ever-smiling magician's assistant Betty Barker inside. London, the Roaring Twenties. When this sawing took place, crowds lined up for blocks. Selbit stagehands dumped red and water into the gutters behind Finsbury Park Empire. Nurses stood in white caps by the exits, an ambulance parked out front. As a publicity stunt, P.T. Selbit offered suffragette Christabel Pankers 20 pounds a week to be his permanent sawing block. She declined. <laughs> Um, I think many of you uh, know how the trick works, the sawing and half trick. But um, for those of you that don't, I'll do a little demonstration. <laughs> um, well, first of all, there are two. There, the box it has two parts, so it can be pulled apart. But it's initially closed, and there are two women. So one woman walks in, lies, gets into the box, lies down, puts her feet up the one end of the box, and her head up the other. Meanwhile, there is another woman in the second half of the box crouching like this underneath. Okay, So um, the one woman lies down. The magician twirls his cape. They turn the box around. Um, and meanwhile, the woman who is in the front pulls her knees up to her chest. The woman <laughs> who is down below puts her feet up. <laughs> the, the trick is you have to have the same size foot. So <laughs> OK. All right. <laughs> The house of illusion. She'd say, someday you'll go on without me. She worked the back of the box from underneath where the saw couldn't reach. Her name was Ruby. We had nothing in common but our long skinny feet. She was down there in the dark like Najinsky's fawn in a cream-colored bodysuit, little goat horns that nobody could see, bobby pinned in hair that nobody could see, red streaked and kinked. And of course, the silver shoes, same size as mine, at the end of the box that everybody could see. She was always talking down there. I'm inside Nijinsky's dead brain. She'd get louder when Jack started with the saw. Inside the cloven soul. 
the whole box thumping like a stance, <clears throat> Jack sawing away. Shut her the hell up. But how? That voice splitting me like a headache. It got so I didn't know who I was. She was, I don't know, a sprite. Dressed like a man, dressed as a goat. She'd say, it's magic. And I'd think, I'm not real either up here with my own skinny feet out the end of a box and a lipstick smile like the all-American prom queen. After the show, she'd perch on the bar in her fawn, in her fawn leotard and hold up her drink, always something tall and purple or blue with maraschinos and crushed ice. And she'd say, it's art. <laughs> <coughs> The woman who is sawn in half is in love with Oliver Sacks. I would go up to Oliver Sacks at a party and he wouldn't sidle away when he asked, what do you do? And I told him. Oliver Sacks at 80, Mercury on the periodic table. Now I'm in love with Adrian Rich, or at least in love with the poem that says, I touch you knowing we weren't born tomorrow. Is it better for me to love the Adrian Rich who built the poem or the Adrian Rich inside the poem? Oliver Sacks doesn't remember faces, but he would recognize me in a poem. Oliver Sacks is happy to be Mercury, solid when it's cold. He can turn on the heat whenever he wants. When I am 80, I will still love my box. My box is a tooth, and I am the root. My box edged with gold. Why am I lying in a box? Because it fits me like a ruby slipper. Because taking up snakes is illegal in every state but West Virginia. The box is my gift horse. Don't look it in the mouth. But what if being sawn in half makes nothing happen? What if I click my heels? What if I click three times? I'm deathly afraid of death by regret and of the mad and their lousy weather. So. I'm going to read a poem in the voice of the box. Um, the box gets sawn in half as well. <laughs> After hours, the box, all lacquer and gold locks, foretells, has an epigraph. The monarchy, to survive, must put on a show for the people. Lo, the future has five sides and a lid. On the top of the lid is painted curtains. On the underside, sky. Sky a Magritte blue like an empty coat, ache persistent as a battlefield. My mama was a gypsy wagon, my papa a pine box draped with a flag, as is, always was, ever will be. Once I watched the gypsies carry the saint down to the sea. I was a baby and they wrapped me in flowers and a sequined shawl. I'll show you, the king said, but I saw his fate in the bottom of the cup. Lo, the populace will vote in a new king. Lo, he will provide for us another war. And we're back now in the voice of the woman herself, son in half. Once a god painted his sky blue like the sky to be invisible above the battlefield. And there, it's referring to Amun, the Egyptian god who's invoked at the end of Jewish and Christian prayers. I paint myself red, like Gabriel's copper-tinted wings in the window of Basilic Saint-Denis. The light would pass through me and I'd color, I'd change everything. The magic, of course, I always say, is not in being sawn in half, but in the rebirth. Climbing back on stage night after night, the ritual of it all. Or I'd paint myself red like Matisse's red room to plant an idea, something like that. He said something like that. Or maybe the red in Picasso's girl before a mirror, where the red holding the mirror is the color of the box, my box, my twin curled up inside. There is always another girl hidden in the mirror. The mirror is always red. Red has many values. The troubadour's rose, the whore of Babylon's red hair, the red you're waiting to see spill across the stage when I'm sawn in half. I like the idea of planting an idea. In China, red is the color for brides, and in the Renaissance, Mary wears red under her cloak. Some gods are painted red, visible in the blue sky above the cannons, but not on the battlefield. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to switch gears for a few minutes to another battlefield. Um, I have another book um, called Little Steel. Little Steel is a long poem which is written in sections, so it's a little tricky. You can't just dab here and there into it, so I'll read the first couple sections. It's based on a steel, a steel strike that took place in my hometown of Maslin, Ohio in 1937. It's a strike that affected the town for decades and really still does. When I was growing up, no one in my family talked about the little steel strike. We didn't learn about it in school. It was a strike brutally put down by Republic Steel, but it set the stage for recognition of the union and for labor reforms. These days, a mess and the mills are gone, and the town is dead. I mean, half, more than half the town is boarded up. Um, I think if you're talking or thinking about political poems or poems of engagement, something to think about is audience. To whom are you speaking? Do you expect to make things happen? To kind of paraphrase, paraphrase Auden. I started working on this poem in the 80s and the 90s, um, but I really didn't find my audience until a couple years ago. I was writing about the strike because of a need in myself, but I wanted it to be heard. But for various reasons, it was sitting in my drawer for years. But a couple years ago, it's a long story, but Burlington's wonderful poem I press encouraged me to publish it. And then I was invited to read my poem in Maslin at an event of the Steelworkers Organization of retired, Active Retirees. It was the first time these folks had heard a poem about themselves telling their story. In some places, maybe it's analogous to how African Americans or the LGBTQ community feel about the recent brilliant outpouring of poems by their peers. Someone putting words to their experience, <coughs> acknowledging it. Although there still aren't too many poems about steelworkers. Um, so I'll read the first two sections. It, the poem features uh, some 1937 immigrant steelworkers, two of whom got, were shot. Um, in this, during the strike. Um, when I read the poem in Ohio, Trump was <laughs> trumpeting against immigrants. I mean, he still is. But I said to the steelworkers group, we're all immigrants. Some of us just got here sooner than the others. And they broke into rousing applause. So, you know, sometimes steelworkers are stereotyped, but you should. OK, little steel. Let us praise Fulgencio Casada shot in the back of the head. Let us interrogate the bullet. Oh, but the strikers threw a rock. And let us place, praise Nick Vathias, or Vadias, or Vadlas, gunned down at the door to the strikers' kitchen. Excusable homicide. Praise the union who took up a collection. Calzada's BB blasted four-foot crosses over near the fence. But what's become of Vathias' cross so we could check the spelling? Praise the Erie Street Cemetery that dips and rises for acres, gray slabs smack dab in front of black marble monuments the size of mobile homes. A far cry from Rose Hill where my father is buried, dead level cow field on the other side of town where the great equalizer has stomped the graves, heel printing identical flat metal plaques and pop-up metal vases. But behind Erie's mausoleum, the footstones of four, section four are flanked by lumps and sags. Even in death, the worst real <coughs> town. The west border plunging to rambling, defunct Republic steel. So praise Betty, Betty the furnace, and Betty my best friend in high school. $10 million fired up in October 1926. Hundreds of steel men in attendance gaping like medieval bumpkins at Rems Cathedral. Big Betty, one swell lady, processed 6.5 million tons of iron before she was banked for the last time in 1965, raised in 1974. Praise the girders, the pilers, pilings, the stainless pots and pans, the roller bearings, the handrails, the chassis, the gears, the road signs, the crankshafts, the tankers, the hulls, the kitchen sinks, the bread knives, the bed springs, the train tracks, the lorries, DC-3s, praise steel, praise Maslin steel. Marion Red. 25 years from high school, last night's Hold That Tiger still reverberates. We stood and ridiculously sang before the buffet and then again at midnight. 
I can't decipher this Erie Street Cemetery map, so follow a hillbilly Virgil, a kid with an orange mustache, with a twang I got knocked out of me when I was 10. We keep her up by selling graves, he says. What if you run out of plots, I say. He waves toward a new section across the street, fresh dead maintaining the old, the infallible formula of social security. Section four, he says, is the only place where the fill has sunk. The foreign side, he says, kicking at one of the mounds. They came from Italy, from Greece, from Slovakia, from Spain. They came up from West Virginia. My mom said, don't let on, that's where your dad's from. They came from the south, though blacks had to settle in the bottoms. The mill, the mill, blood brothers, they married the mill. Mary and Red, wish yourself. Battalions of smokestacks keeping them true, big shotguns on end, Mary and Blue. Veil of ash of unremitting heat, acres of soot, gritty wedding cake basilica, a promise big as a city, brick, looming, separated by a moat, the Tuscarawas River, from the good side of town. Some days the sun cut red through the haze, and some days she didn't bother. Oh, but it was a dream. In 1937, they fisticuffed for $5 a day, a 40-hour week. By 1986, $600 a week, time and a half overtime, if interview with Uncle Bob. I did a number of interviews with people in town. Of course, you have your foreigners that did the rough jobs down there, like chipping and scarfing, which is real bad for your health. They lived on the other side of town, over in Columbia Heights. They'd come in by the hundreds, and there'd be 20, 25 of them living in one house his size. They'd have bunks in the basement and little cupboards for their bread, and they'd save every dime and send it back to Italy. <clears throat> then when they'd made enough money, they'd go home without any teeth. They'd all lose their teeth from the acid fumes in the soaking pits. If they didn't quit young, they were dead, because it killed them, sure as you're a foot tall. Okay, I'm going to go back to Box and to his other theme, which is abortion. I worked for over 25 years at the Vermont Women's Health Center in Planned Parenthood. Um, and I'm gonna start with the Villanelle, which is on page two. Um, a villanelle is a form that re it repeats lines throughout the, the poem. So it's great for obsessive themes or for obsessive personalities. <laughs> um, and there are references to the poet priest Gerard Manley Hopkins and his poetic technique of sprung rhythm in the poem. And I wrote this poem after Dr. George Tiller, an abortion provider from Kansas, was shot in the head. He usually wore a bulletproof vest, though I'm not sure about that day because he was killed in his church just before a Sunday service. It's called Bulletproof. <clears throat> Today it's Hopkins and his obscure spiritual contraptions. Everything I read is heart corseted like a concealable vest, police surplus good as new. Some fanatic is packing a gun. I turn to Hopkins, living speech, sprung, stressed, compressed, then I'm off again, help me, obsessed. Oh, restless mind, my own spirit, strange spiritual contraption. Armor with a warranty, order online, unless you're a felon. But a killer aims at your head when you're his holy pretext, right to choose, third eye, bullseye. Some fanatic is packing a gun. Why is the body so feared? It's physicality, it's passion. Even Hopkins, the beauty of the body is dangerous, wrestling with God, that obscure spiritual contraption. Last week I read we're wired for God, blessed evolution. We're spring me, wired to control, oil, water, sex. God help us, tonight a fanatic is packing a gun. Another doctor shot, the killer thinks he's won. Bodies are cells, mere rhetoric. Beauty is the spirit fleshed. I mourn, I get ready for work, I put on my contraption. It presses on my heart. Some fanatic is packing a gun. Okay, so I'll read some of the nutty sections. Um, they're prose poem sonnets. <laughs> so what I had was a set margins and then just when I got to the end of 14 lines for one, that was the end of that one. But it sounds easier than it was. <laughs> um, 
it's kind of a complicated story. Nettie died of an abortion, but she probably wasn't even pregnant. Um, there's secrecy, incompetent doctors. She was taken to a dicey neighborhood to convalesce at a boarding house run by a midwife, Mrs. Beatty. Uh, the author of Nettie's Ruin, as, the, as they called him in the newspaper, <laughs> skipped town. There was a big trial, headlines in the paper for months. Nettie's brother, who'd, help her get, who'd helped her get the abortion, could have been sent to jail as an accomplice. Legally, in 1902, there was a controversy whether a woman who had an abortion was a victim or a perpetrator of a crime. Hard to believe that we're back at that place again today. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I'll read a few of the sections. It's called Box Set. For my great aunt Antoinette, Nettie Vope, 1880, 1902. One, Nettie in a pine box. The family Bible says died young, erased, then written in again. A scandal, my mother says, botched, back alley, in all the papers. My mother's name is Moo. He took advantage, got her drunk. My great-grandma, Nettie's mother, Susan, I'm named for her, saw a bell of fire in Nettie's shoes left out on the landing. Why don't you go back to teaching? Names, begotten, a line of heroes, toting muskets, bugles, our ticket to the DAR, proper. Nettie's name erased. Who wrote it back? Moo says, our people didn't slight men's names, doing muskety things, no family tree for Antoinette. Antoinette Nettie Bope, Frenchified Ohio. My mother's name is Moo. She told me everything she knows. My name is Sudie. Sudie don't brood. No one likes a gloomy puss. Nettie has a lovely tombstone down in Thurston. Okay, then I'm going to switch to three. Is it true Nettie wasn't pregnant? But she thought she was. Did she try one of those mail order concoctions? The parsley seed cure? Did it screw up her hormones? Everybody took them, ads and church bulletins for blocked menses. But she was seen by doctors, Hoskinkins and cooks. Did they even know how to do a pelvic exam? They inserted implements, bent, smooth, bent spoons, pen holders, wire attached. But can't repeat. 1968, Baltimore, ex waiting in a bar while I go to the doctors to get a rabbit test to get a phone number so somebody could drive me someplace in Pennsylvania, blindfolded. X had had a few beers by the time I got back to the bar. The doctor's waiting room was standing room only, thick with smoke. And then I'm switching to 11. Nettie died not knowing. Tell me it was a blessing. Sooty, sooty. How old was Mrs. Beatty? Was she motherly? Early on, she'd said, I try to do all the good and as little harm as I can, but I always get the worst. Nettie's own mother put a tiny pillbox on her head, shut herself up in the parlor. Her father said, no more girls will leave the farm. Now my mother at 83, 30 years older than Nettie's aged father when he was summoned to Columbus, standing in the graveyard down at Thurston, her hair so white, wearing the white wool coat she bought for my wedding years ago, her black patent leather pocketbook, enormous, slung over one arm. You don't have to lug around that purse, I call to her. It'll be perfectly safe in the car. She shakes her head and takes hold of the clasp with both hands. The boats are right here, she says. Twelve. Right here, Moo says again, clasping the boat family headstone, frowning slightly. Her other grandparents were her favorites. The boats were a nervous bunch, she said, and the sisters fought like barn cats, but they were loyal to each other. Nettie's tombstone, a few feet down slope from her parents' graves, faces away from the churchyard in the direction of the old farm. A polished granite square wreathed with scraggly brown grass. Antoinette, daughter of W.W. W. and S.L. Bope, July 7, 1880, May 30, 1902. It's a beautiful marker, Moose says. Now do you feel better? Back in the car, she looks tired, small. It's starting to drizzle. As we turn north from the cemetery out into the main road, she looks over her shoulder and sighs. She fumbles in her purse for her compact. Didn't you ever want children? And then I'll read um, 15, the last, the composite poem, 
but what I did is I did it as an erasure poem. So it started off with the 14 lines and then I erased most of it. <laughs> I mean, because her name was erased <coughs> in the family Bible, so it made sense to me. Um, and it also made it easier. <laughs> 15. Erased. Nettie. Died not. Guilty. They dug the grave. Okay, I'll end with a poem called American Pastoral. American Pastoral, Autumn, house of no need, death at the door and you drowsing in the sun. Oh, rocking chair, rocking chair, freckles, cornstalk hair, house of no seed corn drawing, so many lacquered afternoons and now another. Bees, bees, why bother messing on the golden rod? Ah, America in fine fettle while the fields burn. Thank you for everybody for coming. Um, I'm going to read um, some newer poems, and um, oh, thank you. Many that were um, there's a there's a series of um, of a series of poems that are based loosely on some kind of pop science um, evolution, and my question has been as human beings, how much have we actually evolved? Mm -hmm. We like to think we've evolved, but hmm. um, This is poem is called A Common Misperception. It's quiet like that, bucolic. Looks like nothing's going wrong anywhere at all. Bare trees rocking back and forth. Three crows chasing an owl across the field into the woods. Yesterday, men appeared at the top of the drive, rifles, orange vests, big boots. At the same moment, dog ran at them, barking, and a 350-ton C-5 Air Force cargo plane grazed us all. Its 200-foot wingspan at treetop, the noise of it making each of us hold his or her breath for a moment. Dog didn't bite the men. The men didn't shoot the dog. Plane didn't crash. Of course, they were puzzled by the woman shouting from the doorway of the house. I wasn't shouting, I was swearing. At dog, at men with rifles, cargo planes, forest, one week after San Bernardino, the inexplicable mother and father. It gets confusing, which was which, when and where, hands up or down on the ground, on a bike, in a car. We heard the shots, saw someone fall, the plane, boots on the ground, dog barking, one thing blending to another, linkage, linkage disequilibrium, yes, something vestigial in us all. You might be the enemy, you are fighting from the air. What you know might be useful information if you could shake your own self down, could remember what country you came from, what language you were taught to speak. If you were the men in the plane, or the men the plane had come to take. If you were the plane, or if you were the bolts on that plane, or simply a passenger. What feeds us, what we feed on. The men faded back into the house. The men faded back, excuse me. The men faded back into the woods. The plane disappeared. <clears throat> Dog came back into the house. That's a, a Massachusetts poem, actually. Um, <clears throat> And I'm going to um, move on to a couple of um, prose poems that I, I have a, uh, a, what do you call it, animal sedarium that's all A, a through Z, um, uh, f sort of fabulistic um, poems that were begun uh, in 2016 two after the election. And there seemed to be no other response. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> because it, again, it all kind of blends together. Um, and this poem is called Anaconda. And in fact, I did not have an anaconda. I do know somebody that did have a bow constrictor. <laughs> but, um, this anaconda um, in the house, it felt very Trumpian in that there was something then, then just we couldn't see it, but it was squeezing us around the middle. So um, anyway, when we brought the anaconda home from the pet store, things seemed to be OK. My, <laughs> my sister insisted on carrying it around with her, though she could barely walk, the snake was so heavy. We were accustomed to that sort of extra load, something a bit cool around the neck and the shoulders bowing down. I told her to put it back in the cage because we hadn't named it yet and didn't really know if it was a him or a her. She put a sock on the snake's tail that night because she was certain it would get too cold in our house, the heat hardly working, and our father gone missing. The next morning, the snake was gone too. There was no food in the house either, and clearly the snake had rummaged through the cupboards, had opened the fridge, and drunk the milk. We saw beads of milk and a ribbon of crumbs on the floor, something we got used to hearing rustle around in the walls of the house all night long. It was like there was some extra muscle in our lives. One night, my sister was giggling in her sleep, and the snake was there around her middle, pretending to tickle her. This is something that happens to girls. The thing wraps around you, you giggle, you forget. <laughs> um, and the next poem is written um, exactly around the time of the Kaufman hearings and the confirmation. And it's, um, I did have a dog that did this, but um, this is sort of, sort of exaggerated. And the poem's called Woodchucks, or The Girl in Need of Some Murder. You do not want them in your fields, the holes they make, places your animals could step into and break a leg, mounds that could tip a tractor over if the kids were driving and weren't so smooth letting out the clutch. And yes, this is a farm story, which is what those of us who grew up on farms have always secretly known is the only story. <laughs> the death, the sex, the birth, the father beating on the cow, the pig getting its throat slit, how you watched whatever happened to be happening and you didn't flinch, two brand new hooves poking out the back end of the cow, then the wet muzzle, the face, then the whole calf body slipping out, thumping onto the ground. There you have it, the wet, the slops, my dog rushing out to eat the placenta, the afterbirth, all that licking and chewing, my dog, how sharp her eyesight. She'd spot a woodchuck from the top of the pasture, and off she'd go. How many times I watched her sprint through the field, grab a woodchuck by the neck, and shake it dead. She'd bring it back, roll in it, eat it. She was the dog that went everywhere with me. She had murder in her. It's true, I liked that. I was a girl in need of some murder. The sharpshooter that was my dog. I was a girl in need of something running fast, fuck down the field and shaking it by the neck. <laughs> so I'm um, actually going to be reading something called The Blow Through Floor. Um, and in other manifestations, it's called um, The Good Math. Um, and it's inspired by, um, it begins with a, with a, a video um, from um, National Geographic of a skater skating on um, black ice in Norway and Sweden. Um, and the most beautiful, pristine ice and the sounds that the skates made were uncanny and, and gorgeous. And um, so it begins with that. And into this also comes, um, into this also comes the fairgrounds, the Tumbridge fairgrounds that are filled with ice. Um, that first winter I was living there, and actually repeated this winter. Um, and um, some references to to uh, Bill 
Bryson's um, at home. It's our crazy architect that, that he talks about. And also um, coming into this, uh, the, um, this fabulous story and video that I saw about the blow through floors in the high rise buildings in Chicago and the 83rd floor it was or something like that where they have a wide open floor so the wind will blow right through the building and not make the building sway. Um, and it um, became for me, you know, it seemed to me like it was something that we needed personally, you know, blow through floor in the body. <laughs> um, so this begins with a with a um, quote from um, Kittredge, and it is a, it is another sonnet crown. Um, I, I wish to bastardize sonnet fourteen lines, um, and and again the last line begins the first line of the next poem. The blow through floor. I learned to walk on that time as if it was ice, every so often getting out a little farther before the surface sagged and creaked and the cracks radiated from the place where I stood for another day. That's from A uh, Hole in the Sky by uh, Kittredge. The song Wild Ice Makes. Skating on the thinnest, most pristine ice when a lake has its first cover thick enough to bear your joy is both an art and a science. The man gliding across the black lid of the lake tells us the cracks beneath his skates making laser-like otherworldly sounds. The thinner the ice, the higher the tone. High C means it's about to break. There's a mathematical equation to it as there is for so many things. You've got your water pressing up from below and the sides of the lake supporting the ice as in a dome. You've got the weight of a man and the air in his lungs and the sky on top of it all. The math is horrible, he says, so don't try it. It's a house with no joists. You're walking on windows. The floor is made of glass. these pages. Two. Yesterday the field was covered in glass, a thin layer of ice, the snow crackling as Dog and I poked our way across it, both of us poking through now and again, nothing mathematical about it, random, Dog post holing in my skis, skidding sideways, no way to predict what would hold and what collapse. We like to imagine we can control it, the breakage, in some of the tallest buildings now, they build a blow through floor so when the wind smacks the building, the building won't sway. It passes through. Otherwise, the occupants might get nauseous, <laughs> might need to get the hell out of there if it was a closed office, a taped up box of a building. Sometimes you hear it, the thud of wind against a house, a tree, a car, a body. My body in plain light in summer standing in a screen door looking at the lake, ear pressed to the phone. My brother telling me about the cancer he's being treated for. A breeze riffles the lid of the lake, grass between us and it. There's leaning into the earpiece to hear. There's someone cooking dinner in the kitchen behind me. There's always a phone call, some kind of notice being given. He was speaking softly. After all, he says, I'm 73. After all, after the wind, some sky, some learning. And I thought of the blow through floor in those high rises when a blast of wind punches the building, it passes through. In olden times, when wishing still helped one. Actually, each one of these is, 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 has got a title, but it's easier to not read the titles. They're all from various places. <coughs> In olden times, when wishing still helped one. It doesn't break, nobody falls down. Maybe the blow through floor is the same as the let it roll off your back floor. It's the don't let it get under your skin floor. It's the nothing and nobody here floor. No doors to knock on, no carpet floor. No year round report, no evals, no boss floor. It's the water over the dam floor. It's the it's not me, it's you floor. It's the nobody at any window floor staring down at whatever boulevard floor waiting for who knows what to happen floor. It's the no crying over spilt milk floor. It's the nobody gets broken floor. Mm -hmm. 
You could be the body that breaks things, the one who walks on the cold frame in the drying yard. You could be the one who held the clothesline and thought she could walk above the small heads of lettuce across a pane of glass. You could be that light child, the magic girl. You could be the one who thought the glass was magic, the sneakers on your feet magic. Of course it breaks. You could be that girl crashing through. You could be the one who came screaming out of that yard bleeding. You could be the one marked, the skin broken, the cold frame broken, the clothesline broken, glass shards in your hands. The inches you need are everywhere around you. That's from every other Sunday or something like that. Shards of glass in my hand, mother in the driveway leaning on the horn. Get up, hurry up, get going. An accident, I said. My hand just flew through the window by mistake. And the brothers cutting holes in the ice to test, to test which of them was toughest, which could hold his head in the water longest. Like there was a hole in the world one could play with, pretend to die and come back. It's a radiant moment, really, a building half demolished, doors opening into the air, chairs, sofas sitting at the edge of the room, six stories above the street, and most of the walls gone. No walls left, nobody home. As in a war, roofs, windows, all the people gone. How we carry what gets broken forward, Sometimes it's there, sometimes not. What my father saw in the war, what he brought back. After Orduf, he wrote to my mother, I'm not sure how a man can come through this and have normal feelings and reactions ever again. I wish to God I were home now. We never knew which door he might blow through, how fast, what he heard sometimes in our voices, teenagers breaking things. Sorry, but the pages. I've often wanted to break things in the office I worked in next to the lake. There were some betrayals, <clears throat> some who said what to whom, one score at a time. All my life I've known girls who score their own skins, little crisscrossings and hatchings as if the skin below the skin needed air, as if not enough was broken. Beyond the window, the frozen lake, people skating across it, scritch of blades, little windows cracking, fish beneath the surface, studying the sounds the crackled sky above them was making. You can walk across it, drive on it, you can cut holes into it. Sometimes someone or something broke through as if the ice were a door, a roof, a glass wall. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> How the wind cracks the door, makes gaps and trees whistle in landscape, like blowing across an empty bottle, like my father singing when he did, head tilted back. We could trust that voice, his face radiant, the songs corny, but nonetheless. Sometimes it's all we need, somebody forgetting what needs to be forgotten. Tonight, the wind sounds like it could fly a person one end of a field to another, one town to the next, the body being a closed office, no windows in it, no blow through. There's some beauty to it, what the wind can do to a landscape, something opening up where everything had been closed, children breaking through what needed breaking. Sometimes something needs some breaking. We broke through doors on horseback, broke into the abandoned school, careened across the wooden floors of the gymnasium, broke some signs, two trucks, one car. If the parents looked at us mad, we broke that too. Sometimes you just need things to go whack, like the river did this winter, packed with ice, bullying itself out of its banks. It filled up the fairground barns, sledges of ice, planks, broken floors, trees, something magical the way it moved in and stayed, all the doors of the barns left open, the animals of last summer long gone. 
all the animals of last summer long gone, oxen, pigs, sheep, the four-legged breath of it all. I would have liked to see the river do its work, hear the sound it made shoving its baggage into the barns, filling them up floor to rafters, the building side by side with the river, doors left open as if to let flood waters pass through, no harm done. Now and again, a structure makes some sense, unlike the boathouse a man built with no doors and the house with a door that opened into a wall. I think of the people padding around the boathouse corner to corner, another man walking into the wall behind the door. Nothing mathematical about it, not the good math. One could be wary of the math, of the possible failure of it, the rides and the midway, the tilt the world teacup, the lunge and plunge, the cogs and gears, the nuts and bolts of it all. Someone has to factor it, do the math, put it together, the wheezing machines churning, lights blazing, screams, laughter. From up on the hill above, one wouldn't know if that was fun you were hearing or something horrible. Children getting heaved into the air, then dropped, flung sideways, upside down, strapped tight to the ride, the doors of their bodies wide open, lights passing through them, the elasticity of children, terrified, pinned against the night sky, tickets in hand, ready to go at it again. Mm -hmm. Ready to go at it again and again, the ponies next day yanking concrete sledges across the ring, handlers shouting, crowds cheering, the inordinate math of it, pulling until one of the team falls to his knees. Nothing my own horse would have done, bucking me off, heading back to the barn. She did what she did until I learned to hang on. I was a 10-year-old on the back of an animal 10 times my size. You can learn to ride whatever needs riding. Those icebergs this winter, shoulder to shoulder in the stalls, like some kind of translucent creature a person might saddle up and ride a weight on. We need it, something that can hold this weight, take us out of here. This is number 14. How much the world can hold, we don't know but we've seen it break and break and break again. There's children's fascination with dinosaurs. This was what was, this is what disappeared. Apparently Jefferson didn't believe anything had gone extinct on the American continent, so sent men out to find the woolly mammoth. Perhaps we're still out there looking for it. Want to see it rise up out of the plains, tusk by tooth of the mastodons, giant beavers, short-faced bears. We'd like to see something walking toward us, field by field, street by street to shining sea, telling us nothing got broken, anything can be repaired. Here's a number 15. You're skating on the thinnest, most pristine ice, a white field covered in glass, this body in plain light, a building that could so easily fall. You hope it doesn't break, though sometimes, yes, you be the body that broke things nonetheless. Shards of glass in your hand, smashed windows, no walls left, nobody home. It's an office you get born to or not, wind cracking the door open, that gap. Sometimes something needs some breaking, though so much already packed up and gone. Wary of the math, the possible failure of it, we go at it again and again one more time. How much the world can hold, we don't know. That's the baby. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I didn't hear that one before. I would have been too intimidated. <laughs> Does anybody have any comments or questions? Or that was so fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I just I love how different your styles are too, and and but yet there were these themes that kept weaving back and forth and in and out, mm -hmm. especially in your poems. That it was fun to see that, and uh, 
that you're, there's so many things in both of your work that were Thank you. kind of hardly formulate questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have quite, I mean, I've, I've heard it before, but I, I, I've never heard with my own ears the connection between your work mm -hmm. as friends uh, oh. you know, <laughs> how you borrowed an idea from Carol and that, you know, works. <laughs> Right. The yeah. 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 I don't usually use form, but it tends it when there's a tremendous amount of material it tends to be one way to convey it, you know, right. and to contain it. Yeah. And and it was so incredible that you both ended with these poems that yours were the erasures and yours was a Nothing rhetorical in either of your writing. I mean, so the, that I think the sometimes sort of legitimate criticism of some of the political writing is that it's just kind of a rant, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this kind of moved deep inside, and so that's just it wasn't. It's not an issue. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, right. Great. It sort of just inhabited the specifics of what you're writing about. So. If there's an argument about it, it's kind of a bullshit argument. <laughs> <clears throat> I agree. When I hear political poetry, I want to run a mile, you know, uh, because I, I assume it's going to be a rant or someone's making a point more than writing poetry. It's just, oh. you know, but these poems are so metaphorical mm -hmm. and full of imagery that they, as Scudder said, they, they weren't rants at all, and yet they were political. Mm -hmm. They're felt. Yeah. The inside. Yeah, that's Margaret Abbott. Any, anybody see Margaret Abbott the other night down here? Where she said that she wanted to, she wanted to just deli you know, give a message. She would have rented a billboard. But you make you embody, you have an embody, you know, metaphor and landscape, and yes. and the thing is, that the political does move inside of us. I mean, it does shape us, no matter what, how, however, you know, we might want to pretend it doesn't, but it does shape who we are and. Um, you know, it's been woven into my work forever. Um, but and Sue's too. Yeah, yeah. It's like it shows up, but you don't tell it to go away. <laughs> you say, okay, you know, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah. I'm curious, um, I think you mentioned that for a little still you had started that work in the 1980s maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, how long has the, the box series um, you know, the woman, oh, the woman in the uh, box kind of been on your I desk. started, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I, well, the information about knitting, my, you know, I worked at an, an, an abortion clinic, women's health clinics for years, and it wasn't until I was in my 40s, and my mother had gone to an, a senior's um, autobiographical writing workshop or something, cause, you know, and so she came back and she had a letter that was written by one of the classmates to her granddaughter explaining about that she had why she had an abortion. Mm -hmm. This is an older woman. And Mother Moo said, oh, here's something you'd like, Sue. And I, of course, went, <laughs> and then she, I think she didn't want to be undone. And she said, well, Nettie, Aunt Nettie had died of an illegal abortion. I mean, you know, she never told me I'd been working, you know, at the Women's Health Center for Planned Parenthood for years. Um, so I, was, and she said it was in all the papers, and I don't know anything about it. <laughs> so I did an interlibrary loan search then, and I, I and mean, this was, oh God, well, that was after, I would say that was in the 90s. I don't, you know, and then um, I got one newspaper clipping that said that, and that he was taken to the place of a Mrs. Beatty in, in a delicate condition. I mean, you know, the writing was very Victorian. And so I thought Mrs. Beatty had done the abortion. So I was writing these long things of, in Nettie's voice. <laughs> and, you know, Mrs. Beatty, and of course I identified with Mrs. Beatty, although of course Nettie had died, but, you know, it was a tricky thing. And then a few years ago I was visiting some friends, and my friend Clyde went up to her she, it was in Turon, you don't have internet access at her house, so she was in, she went into town and was, had it where they can have internet access, and she was just, she punched in, I think I had written, read some of my Nettie stuff to her, 
and she punched it in. And she said she came back and she was Sue. I punched Nettie Bope into the internet, and it came out all these doctors had you know where there was a big trial. So, <laughs> so it was one of those things that had been gone on for years of just sort of stewing about the material. That's partly what happened with Little Steel too. I was stewing. I was interviewing people. I was amassing all these details, and then didn't know what to do with it. And that's actually how I think it. When did I meet you? Three years ago or four years ago? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, anyway, was. <laughs> I, I had, was trying to do some, I was asking people for advice. People were telling me to write a novel, you know. And then I put it aside, and that's when I started doing the box poems. It was like, get me away from this project. I can't stand it anymore. And the box poems were sort of escapists for me, you know. <laughs> and then I heard Carol read, and it was time to come back to the nutty thing. So once I came back to it, it was still, I would say, over a year that I put it together. But I had a lot of that stuff was already written, but it was in snippets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. And then you had the play, remember? Oh, great <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. Read. A stage reading. <laughs> That's right, we had a, a stage reading of, of the little steel people took someone. It was really fun. I forget who you played. Oh, gosh. I can't someone it's took serious. my mother's role in. Yeah. And I forget who you played. I might have been the public. <laughs> um, she got money from the Vermont Council of the yeah. Arts for a year to do something with it. Uh, yeah. that was well, I liked how the actually the, the, the machinery <laughs> is a character. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. From the steel factory. The Betty. Oh. Betty. Oh. Betty. Oh. Betty. Yes. You know, and, and I think it's really interesting because, you know, if we go out and we do a lecture on, you know, unions and labor, you know, you can shut out, you can disconnect, but when you when you tap into the emotion of how people would have felt about that piece of machinery, because if you weren't in that, in a, yeah. I think it's a great way for messaging yeah. to get through. Yeah. And you could imagine those people who, you said they'd never heard of anything written about in their story yeah. told, right. and how mm -hmm. you celebrated all those objects that they made. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That must have felt like right. that. That's <laughs> great liberty there, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so many things. Yeah. Do you really have brothers who stuff their heads? <laughs> 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 That's very laughing over here. I grew up with her and her brothers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> description of all the farm and it's all blood oh, and guts yeah, yeah. and right. death and right. you know, huh. I, I helped my uncle actually help a cow give birth one time and that you know trying to haul the calf out mm -hmm. in that description of it. <laughs> Daniel did that many I times. Know. He's got it. I've been in midwife. <laughs> no cow. More than one. Yeah. So wow. your description of the you know the two hooves appear and then the muscle yeah. and then wow. but my job was because the cow was having difficulty, yeah. was to push the calf back into the cow. Oh. Oh. It's hard to imagine me doing that. But at the time, I was bigger. <laughs> I used to be bigger. So yeah. I didn't appreciate the detail of the, yeah. the sense yeah. of that Thank stuff. You. Yeah, I have a lot of farm poems, and they <laughs> go over the work. And you know, it's it's. A, I'm, I'm a dog. I love the way you oh, call oh, dog. A dog. A dog. Yeah, that's great. Dog. <laughs> dog. Um, but uh, the thing I really loved, and uh, this is my own, uh, I liked all the anger in it, you know, mm -hmm. all the, something needs to be murdered or broken, yeah, or, really. you know, yeah. I needed a dog who would try to kill those woodchucks, you know, <laughs> I've been realizing how much I've repressed that in my life, actually, <laughs> in poetry, too, yeah. so I really thought that was wonderful energy. Yeah. That's a powerful section. Thank you. Yeah. 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 That no, last no. piece of it. No, because I have heard people, astonishingly, the people I've heard have said things that were like, you know, kind of murderous, you know, given our recent politics. And I was like, oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> you needed those words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, but, yeah. Well, uh, Sue and I are in a poetry group, and you really wanted to write that poem about your man, the uh, Supreme Court Justice oh. in Canada. Canada. And it was just, I was just you know, laboring on this poem and I would bring it back. Yeah. And it, was, I, it was, I was reading Jeremiah, you know, and I yeah. was, <laughs> it was so bad. I mean, finally. And then I went and I testified at the State House because uh, on the H 57, I, you know, there's a bill trying to um, make abortion legal in Vermont in case 
the Supreme Court yeah. <laughs> wipes out Roe versus Wade. And I find, and I heard the people on quote the other side quoting Jeremiah and said, he's my prophet. <laughs> <laughs> but you were some fantastic so, stuff. So finally yeah. I just I let I got rid of Kavanaugh and I I, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I wish I had <laughs> the Kavanaugh poem. <laughs> and, and then I have these this, these characters that Sand and Ostrich who are a couple. Just wonderful. Mineral and bird. They're yeah. an unusual couple. And, <laughs> and they talk about their poet and their word because she's all upset about it. she's reading an Old Testament prophet. And, you know. <laughs> See, you're coming out sideways, which is great. It's so much more effective in a way that, you yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful stuff. Yeah. And the, the, the little steel is so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you.